we're talking about transcendence today. This entire book is an elaboration on the relation between the for itself and the in itself. The for itself, as we know, corresponds to the consciousness of an individual. It is human consciousness. The in itself, as we know, refers to the existence of everything that is. Since it refers to everything that is, it is a continuous plenitude of being. Now when we isolate our attention on any given thing in the world, let's just say a rock, we understand that it is our for itself that has separated it from the continuity of being in itself. We could say that the rock, even though we have separated from everything else, has being in itself. In the first two parts of being and nothingness, Sartre introduces nothingness as central to consciousness. The for itself is a nothingness. Human reality is a nothingness. We make meaning in the world by defining things by what they are not, and according to our pursuit, our pursuit of filling the lack that we are. And without these negations, we have no capacity to differ differentiate an object from an object, or an object from ourselves, or the world from ourselves. This is why when we think of what the most basic structures of our consciousness must be, we have to include these negations. This is why we have internal negations and external negations. We differentiate the world from our being with internal negations, and we qualify ourselves with internal negations, and we differentiate objects from other objects with external negations. For example, the cup from the inkwell. This is an example of an external negation. This is all fundamental to consciousness. It is fundamental to having a point of view upon the world. Having this point of view, a human being has more than being in itself. It is more than an object in the world. It, also, it is also a consciousness, a for itself, a nothingness. Now, this could be a point of confusion, because when I say more than, I do not want to suggest that consciousness exists on top of being, being in itself or in addition to being in itself. It is precisely because consciousness is a nothingness that it fits within being in itself. Sartre will later describe the for itself like a whole in being. This lays out a lot of the basics of what is necessary for self-consciousness. We have this first radical negation. This is not me. I am not the content of my consciousness. My consciousness is directed at that which is not me. This negation is a realization of itself through the reflection-reflecting structure, the dyad, that is, unity, that Sartre describes in the immediate structures of the for itself is like the first division. It is what is fundamental to the for itself. And this separation within the reflection, reflecting structure, is the source of nothingness. It allows for the for itself to make an internal negation. That is not me, therefore I am. This original negation is the foundation of its nothingness, from which we then organize being in itself into human reality. The reflection, reflecting structure is like, it's a little bit like the concept of yin and yang, as it is organized together as each as it's each other's own negation. So this structure allows for the for itself to have a relation to being in itself by its capacity to negate. There is a correspondence. It's not seeing objects for what they are in themselves. It is rather a relation to being in itself. Yin and yang is a unity of opposites. These are different ideas, but I, I think it helps us understand what Sartre is getting at. It helps us understand how a dyad is unity, and it helps us understand how negation defines everything by pushing off of what it is not. We qualify ourselves with internal negations, and we itemize and separate the continuity of being into parts with external negations. That is, the, the cup from the inkwell, the chair from the table, and so on. Those are external negations, and they give a discrete identity to the objects that surround us. The inkwell is not the pen, the desk is not the chair. The predicament of a self-conscious being is a kind of isolation. We are separated from ourselves in a certain way. This is because of the nature of our existence means that we are included in the undifferentiated continuity of being. So we have being in itself, 
And to the extent that we cannot apprehend being in itself in the objects that surround us, we also cannot apprehend our being in itself. We cannot apprehend the way in which we are one with everything that is. So we are stranded, surrounded by nothingness, divided by this chasm between ourselves, the subject, and the object, a chasm between the for itself and the in itself. Now, objects arise from reflective consciousness, and Sartre repeatedly refers to the this and this is. And that is because we are not just talking about thetic or reflective consciousness. When Sartre uses the word this, he's referring to the figure and ground relation. So as we will see, there is first an original or radical negation that orients the for itself as not the world around it. We are not what is around us. And this establishes a ground from which a figure, or a this, stands in relief on. We also know that an object is not synonymous with being in itself. It has being in itself, but it is not synonymous with it. Rather, it is the for itself failure to apprehend being in itself that results in the object uh, when in reflective consciousness. In pre-reflective consciousness, the failure to apprehend being in itself could be described as uh, simply as a surpassing of the given. And this is what we're discussing with transcendence. If you are hiking on a trail, you are following a path as a means to get back to your car. You are surpassing the visible trail. And its meaning is the end that you are in pursuit of. In which case, the path is the figure and the landscape is the ground. The path is illuminated. It stands out. So the given is the figure and ground relation that is established from the original radical negation. This original radical internal negation is how the for itself positions itself in relation to everything else there is. We have to have an internal negation to differentiate ourselves from everything else. If you look at the key to special terminology in the back of the uh, Hazel Barnes translation, uh, transcendence is first defined as the process whereby the for itself goes beyond the given in a further project of itself. So that's what we mean when we're discussing this trail. We're, we're surpassing the trail in our pursuit of getting to where it is that we're going. Now this chasm, as I said, is a result of an internal negation. A, a, pri a, a, a radical negation, this original internal negation. This is not me. First must be established in order for us to differentiate ourselves from everything else that is. And Sartre discusses spatiality in an interesting way in this chapter. He defines spatiality as an apprehension by the for itself of itself as unextended. And I want to emphasize that of itself part. He also writes that extension is a transcendent determination, which the for itself has to apprehend to the exact degree that it denies itself as extended. Again, there is this negation of not me that is operating here and how consciousness comprehends the data of experience. Sartre is explaining the role of negation in the apprehension of spatiality. As we surpass what is given, as we fail to apprehend being in itself, we define it in our own terms, according to our own situation, our own pursuit, our own lack. And this is transcendence. Okay, the, the trail is not simply just this means to an end. If you wanted to get to the bottom of what that trail is, it's what is it? It's dirt, soil, what, what is it? You know. So when we define it as a means to an end, we are giving it its meaning. And it's on our own terms. We, we define it in terms of human reality. In this way, the given is a reflection of ourselves. Objects are a reflection of ourselves in the sense that we define them by their use to us, by their meaning to us. And their meaning, their essence, exists through our freedom, our pursuit of filling the void that we are our pursuit of feeling the absence that is what we lack, what we desire. And this lack is made by value, and the pursuit of realizing this value in a potential future. We never quite bridge this chasm 
and that being in itself always escapes us, which is to say that we don't know things for what they are in themselves. So if we don't apprehend things in the world for what they are in themselves, what do we get from them? We have to account for something. We know that something is there. When we look at the moon at night, we know that others can see it as well. We know that it's there. If we know there is a world outside of us, yet we fail to see things as they are, independent of human consciousness, what do we actually apprehend? How do we account for what it is our consciousness is composed of? We apprehend their nothingness. We apprehend the negation of things. Sartre writes, The negation becomes then a bond of essential being, since at least one of the beings on which it depends is such that it points toward the other, that it carries the other in its heart as an absence. If we consider the way in which objects seem to come into and out of existence, we have to remember that it's the for itself that differentiates them from being. It is their negation, it is non-being, that allows us to see them as having a discrete existence. This is why Sartre discusses universal time at the end of the chapter. In the previous chapter, we established that temporality is not. In other words, what we understand as temporality is actually a structure of the for itself. This is because being simply is. It is human consciousness that differentiates objects from being in itself and moments in time from each other. But if we reflect on that for a moment, we realize that we have to account for what appears to us as time. We must account for what seems to come into the world and what seems to decay out of apparent existence. Most of this, again, could be explained with an analogy with spatiality. I mentioned this in my previous video on temporality. The word now is a lot like the word here, in the sense that what we think of as now has to do with our point of view upon the world, in which a past and future seems to emerge behind and in front of us. The word here, spatially, doesn't correspond to an actual, fixed, objective, physical location. It simply refers to your own being for itself, your own point of view. Sartre refers to the appearance of objects coming into existence as apparition, and he refers to objects ceasing to exist as abolition. What appears as time to us seems to be in contradiction with the absolute plenitude that is being in itself. How could this absolute density of being ever change if it simply is? Ultimately, the nothingness that is human reality, that can negate being, that can introduce multiplicity to being through its many negations, establishes a relation between the for itself and in itself. Imagine creating your own jigsaw puzzle, starting with an image printed on a piece of cardboard. We can imagine this as being. It represents the continuous plenitude of being. There is nothing other than the unity of this one image. As you carve the shapes into it, you do not add anything to it. At the same time, you are creating a multiplicity of pieces, each with their own discrete existence. You could label each piece according to how you may want to differentiate them. You could label them according to their color, or you could just give them letters and numbers. These labels won't necessarily say much about the unity of the entire image, but they will help you na navigate their assembly. Now let's extend this analogy and try to imagine the same principle existing over time. Imagine you had to carve out each piece with an X-Acto knife instead of simply stamping the jigsaw cut onto it the way they are manufactured. In which case, individual pieces appear to come into existence as they are cut away from the whole, and they appear to withdraw out of existence as they recede into the continuity of everything else once they're assembled into one. The shape that each piece is given is like a negation of its being, a negation of the wholeness with the completed image. The act of negating creates a fixed correspondence to the whole. One piece cannot be interchanged with another. There is a system of relation that is imposed upon the whole. We can think of the shape of each piece as the negation of wholeness present in them. We can see why, then, that we must account for universal time, even though we have determined time to be a structure of the for itself, even though we know that temporality is not. 
When we observe things in the world coming into and out of existence, we are, we are observing non-being. Now, just because we introduce this nothingness into the world doesn't mean that what we negate doesn't exist in terms of a whole, in terms of being. There is a system of relation that emerges from this. External relations emerge from this. Causality emerges from this. Our scientific understanding of things is best described as the view from nowhere, to use a quote from Thomas Nagel, and that captures this ex ex external relation. It is adopting the point of view of externality, where only external relations are accounted for. There is no I in science. The first-person perspective is useless in science. It's all about measurement, statistics, data. Sartre briefly discusses quantity. He writes that quantity is pure exteriority. It does not depend on the terms added, but is only the affirmation of their independence. As I just said, the scientific perspective is about measuring things, the shape of things, the size of things, the quantity of things. It excludes qualia to the extent that it excludes what it's like to experience things, what it's like to taste the lemon. Sartre describes quality as nothing other than the being of the this when it is considered apart from all external relations with the world or with other thises. It is the sourness of the lemon, the yellowness of the lemon, and these qualities interpenetrate each other. We apprehend them together. When we isolate a quality from of this, we are abstracting. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this chasm, this unbridgeable gap between the for itself and the in itself, is first brought about with the original upsurge of the for itself, or consciousness. It is created by a negation of being. Consciousness, the for itself, is a nothingness in that in its original upsurge it negates being. And I know I'm repeating myself here, but it's important to really hammer this point in. It seems confusing at first, but if we think about what is necessary to have self-awareness, we realize that we first must differentiate ourselves from everything that is streamed into our consciousness. Everything that consciousness is composed of seems to flood in from every direction, and in order not to identify with this content of our consciousness, there has to be an original radical negation. If we try to define what it is that we are, we have to refer to our consciousness. That, that, that is common sense. It is our consciousness that makes us what we are, but our consciousness is composed of what we are not, because our consciousness is always of something. It is intentional. It is directed at what we are not. We are not the objects that surround us. We are our consciousness, so we have to separate the consciousness that we are with an internal negation. Otherwise, we would coincide with everything we see and touch and smell. We wouldn't be able to differentiate anything, and we wouldn't be able to differentiate ourselves from the world. Such a gives the example of fascination, and this is something that we could all relate to. I could think of uh, you know, a moment when I found a fossil of a leaf here in Wyoming. I picked up this rock and it was shaped and textured as a leaf. It had all the veins still intact, all this tiny detail. And uh, I brought it close to my face and I was completely absorbed in all of these details. And in this moment, my entire consciousness is composed with this sensory experience. I'm not thinking about anything else because I am fascinated by the image of a leaf from 40 million years ago. Whatever thoughts that would ordinarily pass through my head are absent in this moment. I am not coinciding with this object. I know that it's not me, yet my entire consciousness is composed of it. I must have an internal negation to, to differentiate it from myself. Through negation, we organize the appearance of being in itself, the given, from the undifferentiated plenitude that it is into human reality, which is a multiplicity of things. Negation allows the for itself to negate itself, and in this way it is the foundation of its own nothingness.